So by 2015, at the age of 40, all the life that I had been building up until that point had crumbled. All the external achievements, all the reality, all the marriage, the, 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 the band was, had been, I quit the band, I couldn't afford it. And I had a business that, you know, I kept that going. But I was kind of broke. Um, as, a, as a single guy sort of supporting my, my wife and child, I could kind of, you know, I was proud to say that I, I paid for everything. You know, Eva, Eva didn't really have a job for a while. She kind of helped me with the business, but it was always hard to find a role that, that she really fit well. And of course, since I was the guilty one, um, she, she lived in the, in our flat. She had the car and I paid for it all. And that, that amount came to something like almost $3,000, like around $3,000 or, you know, close to that in euros per month. So there wasn't a whole lot of money for me to start a new life of any kind. There was enough for me to buy some food and to be in my apartment. And I recorded music. I made another album, a solo album. Not terribly proud of that one, but there's there's value and there's beauty in, in, in all the in all the different different albums, not in every song. Some some succeed, some fail. But I enjoyed recording. I had, to, I had time to focus. I read a lot. I began writing at some point spiritual topics and I fully threw myself into this new spiritual um, awareness and, and I saw life differently I was I was I let go of all that all that heaviness of, of all the ego and I agreed to such unfavorable terms for myself because I was vulnerable right I, I still was an expat in in Eva's country and I still needed help surviving and I couldn't really go to war with her. I didn't really even want to get divorced because I, I felt more vulnerable being divorced. And so I just gave her all my money. And I even signed an agreement of that kind of ridiculous amount, a private agreement that we had notarized. But I wasn't really thinking about what I'm going to do for the future because you, you can't just keep making more and more money to make up for your, mis for your financial mistakes in terms of spending. And Eva's as a spender... And she had a luxury life, and I was paying for it. And I had a basic bachelor's life with, with nothing going on. But I wasn't resentful about that. I was, I was grateful for the person I was becoming. I was grateful to have um, an amazing partner in Zuzana. And I want to tell you more about my relationship with Zuzana, because now that was... I saw that as my primary relationship. I mean, my she was my partner, even though she, we weren't living together. I thought of her as my girlfriend, and I was her boyfriend. And something else. Here we go. You thought you thought you were clear from the difficult topics. Um, <laughs> no, 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 not not with my story. One more thing I didn't tell you about from the previous five years is toward the end of the thing with Eva. Um, you know, I told you earlier about about my strong desire and fantasy for a threesome. And I told Zuzana about this. And at first, she wasn't really up for it. And I said, that's fine. And then sometime after that, she said she, she wants to try it. You'll have to ask her for all the reasons, but, but it was her decision. And I had a friend from before about the same age as Susanna, um, who also had said that she would try it years ago, years before. And so I wrote to her and introduced them through email, and they got to know each other. And this is when I was still with Eva, living with Eva. And we planned this, I planned this business trip <laughs> um, to Bratislava. And Susanna came with me on the train, and we met our friend, and we spent two 
absolutely mind-blowingly blissful days the whole weekend in a hotel room, in a beautiful hotel room, the three of us. And it was everything that I had fantasized and more. And everyone had a great time. Um, this is not about going into <laughs> erotic details, but, but everyone had a great time. Everyone was very happy. There was no jealousy. We found out that as long as everyone's needs are being met, if everyone's being paid attention to, touched, or paid attention to in some way, there is no jealousy. Zero. It was kind of shocking. So all these years, to, to, be, to be tortured under the idea that sexual jealousy is inevitable in human nature and unavoidable, we had just disproven the whole thought system that runs our lives, that runs our lives um, around the world in a world that makes sexual jealousy something of a god. That it's taboo to even talk about or even to question. And I'm not saying that it's always easy, the idea of your partner touching someone else or watching it happen or being part of it. But I'm saying that it's possible and that and that the jealousy, the feeling, whatever feelings there may be at times, if you're loving and, and you love each other and you trust each other, you can work through a bad feeling. It's just a feeling. And then next time there isn't there isn't a bad feeling. Or if there is ever again some kind of someone says something wrong, it's like any relationship. If you say something wrong, um you can talk through it and you can hold each other's hands and 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 cry if you have to and then and then you're fine because you still love each other and you're honest and you know each other and you accept each other and you love the person for who they are and at that time even even though i was well, this is actually before i sort of this first one was before i had my spiritual awakening but it was not a negative experience it was a liberating experience it was the most amazing thing. It was everything I hoped it would be. And all my my belief that Eva could maybe have healed herself, her jealousy, her resentment, if she had tried it years before, I think I'm right about that. I think you have to just drop your ego and try something if that's what your partner, your husband, your spouse wants to do. That's what I do whenever I had a challenge. Whenever she wanted me to do, do something, to you know, buy something or to go somewhere, I didn't feel like it or I wasn't sure, I did it. I tried. And Zana had given me something that no woman has, had ever given me. My ultimate fantasy, and it was the biggest gift. I'm not, I mean, not going to say biggest. Or what, it was a gift that no woman has given me. And I felt so loved. And I had healed because whenever you take a dream or a fantasy, whether it's, be, whether it's starting a band, whether it's moving to Europe, whether it's writing a book, or whether it's having a threesome, if that's your strong fantasy, that's going to haunt you until you do it. If there's anything you've always wanted to do but never tried, that's haunting you. It's holding you back. You can't go past that. You can't. I probably never would have grown I never would have gotten to my spiritual awakening if I hadn't first gone through that because I, I, I knew the reality of it. I got past that fantasy as, as something that was this profound thing that I was, you know, obsessed with and focused on. And so when, when it came to the point where, where she and I were actually together as a couple, it didn't come with any kind of terms. In fact, here's, here's our terms. I love you. You love me. Okay. Our terms are complete openness and honesty about everything, even if it hurts someone's feelings. You've got to be honest right away. No promises about anything, about tomorrow or forever. We do not own each other. We are best friends. We are both free. So that's called love between two people. And if you can, if you can be with someone who's also spiritually healed, not living in their ego mind as their primary thought system. If two people can be, can know what love is on some level, that love comes from within, you don't need the other person, you don't depend upon the person for love. If your two healed people decide to do a relationship in this way, my 
our theory was that we would we would always be happy that there would never be these problems later on either way we felt amazing and life was beautiful we had each other and and it was everything that you would imagine it was it was all those moments that i had with a person before even though i might have had one or two nights with somebody and it was wonderful and it was open just like this i always realized that those women were just like eva because it always came to some point where I was guilty of something at some point. Or there was the thought system that was the same as with Eva. So there, there was never any, any thought that I would leave her for, some, for anybody else. Because I realized that on some basic level, everyone is kind of the same. It would be the same problem. I wouldn't escape my problem by being monogamous with someone else. And I also knew, I knew myself well enough by this point at age 40 that if I was going to ever agree to monogamy, that I would start wanting non-monogamy. <laughs> it was just, maybe I'm stubborn, I don't know, but I just was realistic enough about my, I knew myself well enough to know that I would never agree to monogamy as a rule. So basically, Duzana and I agreed, our only rule in life was that there was no rules. Our intention was to love each other, to be best friends, take care of each other. But that part was easy because we're good people. But beyond that, there were that no matter what happened, if we lived together, if we would someday have a ch child together, whatever, there would never be any rules or expectations. We fundamentally agreed that honesty and openness and no rules is basically the functioning of our relationship because it felt right. Because, because she had watched what happened with Eva. We, you know, she knew everything. She watched the whole thing. She was part of it. She knew the, that it would never work for, for me. And I knew that. It was never even any conversation. There were times that we had little fights in the beginning because, because I had bad habits still. I had still that trauma from Eva and I would still use some of the same tactics. It wasn't her fault. I, I would sometimes project guilt onto Susanna because I thought that she was she would say something and I would think that she meant something else <laughs> like other women, you know. And I, it took me so long to understand that when she said something, maybe there was some problem with language because she, her English was not great, you know, um, that I misread something. And with, with, with Eva, it was always that that sort of underlying negative tone was real. But in Susanna, there was no underlying negative tone. She was 100% pure. She literally... Whatever she said, she just literally meant it, maybe said it wrong, but didn't mean it that way. And I would jump to conclusions and accuse her of something. And she would she would start shaking and crying because how dare I accuse her of being like Eva? How dare I, I treat her ever like I did with Eva? And then there was also the element that I was still sometimes trying to get back with Eva because there were no rules, right? So... I didn't create like some kind of a safe foundation for her, but she, after all, she was only she was only you know mid twenties, so it was pretty low risk for her on her side. And during these times, because because of our arrangement that we had agreed to that was working so well for us, we continued to be open to having threesomes, and so we had a lot of fun. Um, more times than, than I can count with, with you know, um, bringing a third woman into, into the, or sorry, third, a second woman into, into our life. We had some bad experiences just because it was the wrong person, but we never turned on each other. Uh, we conquered jealousy. And of course, I encouraged her to do whatever she needed to for her needs and fundamentally got to the conclusion that she doesn't have those needs, or at least not yet. That other men don't treat her where she feels safe and has fun and wants to do that with other men. And, and she was, was totally happy with, with our romantic and sex life. So I'm a very lucky man. Um... For her, to, for her to be open to giving me something so profoundly impossible for almost anyone else and, and 
to do so lovingly and, and, and the whole thing, creating beautiful friendships and, and spreading love, basically. Everybody who we came into contact with, um, I think it was a wonderful experience for everybody. Now, again, I think it's a little bit tricky because, because a lot of these women probably have to not tell their future partners about this and things like that. So I think it does cause some problems. And I'm not saying that this is for everybody, but I'm saying this is what, this is what we did. And hopefully we'll do it again. It's been a little while, but um, that's fine. We'll get to that in the, in the final talk. Um, so it's no, for me, the sex part became no longer... A need actually it's no longer where I sit there and 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 miss something not happening or I, I long for something during this time I was 100% content to be with her or to be alone for that matter and once in a while we would you know have some fun and, and meet somebody and go online and try to you know try to make something happen but honest with honesty with without any games and and then Ellie started coming over to visit and it was really hard you know, for the first little while of me living in the in the new flat, I would go and visit Ellie and play with her in her room and go take walks and do things like that and bicycle and whatever. And eventually I've agreed that that Ellie can come to my apartment. And she must have been about, about what age? About five, six. And she was so cute. She was just, I had a few toys there for her. I got her room ready and she would climb all over the counters and play with her Minecraft swords. And, and we lived in a place where, where outside there was this beautiful pl children's playgrounds and there's all kinds of neighbor kids playing all the time. And we, you just hear sounds of kids. There was a preschool outside. Um, so it was a beautiful place to live. We're, we called it treetops because we were on this second story right up in the treetops. And that was our view with a little balcony, tiny place. Americans would be shocked at like tiny house living, but we made it work. Two bedrooms. Small living room, kitchen, open, old building, but kind of remodeled place. It was kind of, it was nice, but loud. You hear all the neighbors doing everything upstairs. They heard us. They heard what we're up, what we're up to as well. And um, made music. I wrote books. Zana creates. She creates beautiful paper art. Look up paperartfactory.eu. That's her work. She's a very creative person. She she got a job at, at T System, so she got a corporate job for a couple of years. So she would go off and go to work in the morning, and I would do my thing and do my work and my music and my projects and and um, do some mountain biking. And that's the other thing is she's a mountain biker. I mean, can you imagine that? When when we met, she knew all the same music that I know, like all the most obscure indie stuff. Even though she's 15 years younger, she knew all that stuff, even the most obscure. And she loves mountain biking, and I've always I've always loved mountain biking. Oh, and she plays guitar. <laughs> so we had a lot in common. We have a lot in common. And she's the same sign, astrological sign as my mom. Cancer. And she's the sweetest, most loving, wonderful, caring, gentle person in the world, who. I I don't understand. I didn't understand until recently has no ego. She doesn't she doesn't like want to wear sexy fashion. She doesn't want to wear high heels or skirts or she wants to just be normal humble person. But she's so hot. She, she's just completely hot. She's just beautiful, stunning. And yet she wears sweatshirts and, and tennis shoes and, and silly socks and doesn't care. Her parents never spent any money on her. Her parents never loved her properly to be honest and we'll talk about that in the final talk. So she was just in love with me and accepted me and loved me unconditionally. And I loved her unconditionally, even though before we met, she never had been to restaurants or had been taken care of. Um, other than just being fed and laundry done. So she was a very simple girl. And it was so wonderful. Eva, Eva claims she, she's an amazing woman and she has all... No, Susanna has an education. She She's... She has a master's, so she's you know she's smart, but she's she's simple. She her mind is is very smart, but her intuition is what makes her wise. She's so wise beyond her years. 
And eventually we got to a place during those five years where we just stopped fighting about anything. I trusted her. She trusted me. We knew each other. We would go a year without a single disagreement. Like we just don't attack. We don't fight. You could say it's boring. You could say it's very boring. All that ego drama that people have, like, oh my God, I want to yell at you for this or that, and you didn't do dishes. We just did whatever. We didn't keep track of who's doing more or less. Of course I did dishes. Of course I cook. She cooks too. She cleans. First I cleaned, then she took over because she wanted to do a better job. I didn't care. Do whatever. I did laundry, then she did laundry. It doesn't matter. We just, it doesn't matter. We just get things done. There's no drama. It's boring. (laughs) And eventually... I met her parents and they were nicer than I thought. I was my nice self and they had to kind of accept me, I guess. And it was fine. I came to visit a few times and she officially moved in with me. She was my girl. Um, so that went on for a little while, a couple of years. And I knew that we had to address the topic of, of having a kid. Because she, of course, this perfect woman has to be a mom. And she wanted to be a mom. And she was turning 29. And I'm like, how long do you want to wait? She's like, well, it's kind of time, isn't it? You know, but not much longer. I said, okay. And finally, one day I said, I want to have a baby with you. It was my decision. And so we started trying to get pregnant and it took a long time it took like in this case it took like a very long time the whole year or close and i we started doubting whether we were were going to get pregnant and then finally we did and um in 2018 was born leonard milan manny my beautiful son perfect little baby and he was a big one, and she and Susanna's a tiny, a tiny, skinny girl, and she had the biggest baby. Her stomach was 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 out so far, her belly was out there, and it was dangerous. Like she was, he was just way too big. And at the same time, during her pregnancy in two thousand eighteen, um, you know, I had this arrangement with with Eva that I could see Ellie like three times a week, every other weekend at my place. And it was fine. I was seeing Ellie enough after school, doing homework together, playing Xbox together. She liked to play a lot of Minecraft and Roblox and uh, not Roblox anymore, but um, Rocket League and those kinds of like Raymond and things like that. We play together. We do homework together, and I'd take her home every you know Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then weekends we had wonderful times together. And this went on for a couple of years. And the, the summer that Z- that Zana was pregnant. She was due in September, so she was very, very pregnant. We had a wonderful summer, and I recorded... I was making a movie about our life, and it's called Treetops. And you can find it on YouTube if you search for... Go to my channel, Abscondo Tube, or just search for Treetops, Abscondo, or Treetops 2018. And it's like a full-length movie of this time, exactly how it was. And... At the end of the summer, it was a wonderful summer. We traveled, went to cottages. We, we did all kinds of wonderful things. At the end of the summer, um, Eva told me through a chat, through WhatsApp, that she's moving to Prague with Isabella to be with her partner, her high school boyfriend. And it broke my heart. I was losing Isabella. I couldn't. I cried for a week. I cried for a week straight. I was still with Isabella. I went camping with her. And I cried myself. You know, me and her went alone because Zuzka was too pregnant. And I just cried for a week. And you'll see, if you want to see the details, well, you'll see that that movie if it's interesting. But So I, I was losing Isabella to an expensive private school. Eva was going to leave the apartment here empty not offer me a place for me to live. I was going to keep paying for it. And she was going to move in with her her partner. And they were going to pay for a very expensive private school, like 1,500 euros a month, ridiculous private school. So here's Eva just spending money, doing these wild things, taking Ellie away from me, this perfect little girl 
who needed her daddy. And Ellie was learning spiritual stuff. I was teaching her everything, and she was happy. She was really happy. And I fought it at first. I wanted to try to fight it and stop it, and I realized I can't do that. I have to accept Eva's freedom to live her life. And I'll have to find a way to just visit Isabel as much as possible. And she left. I was heartbroken. And then, like three days later, my son was born. And, you know, my daughter couldn't be there for that. And life had changed again. And that was, that was probably the hardest time of my life. Losing Isabella's, losing access to Isabella in that way. And so Eva agreed that I can see her when I come to Prague or, you know, she has the apartment here. So during summer, I get half the summer. During holidays, I get half the time. Okay, so I, I took what I could get. Still paying that ridiculous amount to Eva. Why? Because I was afraid that if I didn't, I wouldn't see her. I wouldn't see Isabella. But I, at the same time, I have a son. On the, I have a son now. And I have a family here. And I didn't have enough money. She had quit her job to have a baby. And now she has some money from the state for three years, which is a wonderful perk of living in Europe. But not enough money. And we lived a very humble, basic life. Um, at some point, I did get the car because Eva sold it, out to, oh, sold it to me. And her parents paid out my, some portion of the apartment, which wasn't enough money, but I took it because I needed the money. So I had a car. I had an apartment. But money was tight. Business was unstable. And I guess as part of as part of that reality, we decided that you know we love traveling, we love adventure and doing stuff, not just being in the apartment all the time, however nice that was. So we decided to try camping. This is actually before Leonard was born, before she was pregnant the previous year. We bought a tent, really cheap camping set and mattresses and everything else. And we were going to go to Croatia camping because we couldn't afford to go to hotels. And we tried it out first at a lake in Slovakia. And it was wonderful. It was so much fun to be outside all weekend. I didn't want to come home. And we had so much fun just get, waking up early and going to the lake and listening to the ripples on the water. Partying at night, having a campfire. And we went to Croatia and did something else that I, that I, had, that I had wanted to do. <laughs> Um, when I was with Eva, I convinced her to go to a nude beach years before. And she did, amazingly. And it was pretty pretty fun. <laughs> pretty pretty wild. Really, what I found is is at that time, years before with her, that um once you take off once you once you drop your shorts, you know, and everyone else is, it's not really sexual, at least not overtly. Um it's actually humbling. So it's really quiet there. There's a lot of really, really calm, humble people. And you get to enjoy some interesting scenery, good and bad, mostly bad, mostly older people, but some good as well. And you get to swim naked and, and you get to try something that's just out there and crazy. And it's kind of normal in Croatia. Like it's, there's, it's everywhere, FKK. And so I had this idea and Juska wanted to try it. Let's just go as a couple and go camping to the new go camping there, not just go to the beach, but actually camp in a nudist campground. So we we stayed for like a week in the nudist campground, camping, and it was absolute paradise. It was really fun. Um we actually went back there the next year, uh, not when she was pregnant, but the year after that, uh, with a baby, and that was also fun you know it's always challenging to camp with a baby but we did we had a, we had like he wasn't even he wasn't even one yet and we camped in slovakia sometimes for five or six nights in the heat tr just trying to find some shade in the tree just to keep the baby cool she's breastfeeding under a tree somewhere randomly um we went to croatia again to the same place and despite the challenge of trying to you know nurse a a little newborn and, and all that. Um, it was very nice pushing a stroller around there and, and being free. I guess we decided that not to do this though as the kids grow up, as, as he grows up. Some families do. You see actually a lot of families 
with kids of all ages, all the way through teenagers at, at these nudist campgrounds. But I think that's kind of weird. I don't think that's quite right to make your 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 son, you know, once he is of age of having memories, um, having to deal with naked parents for a week straight. Although a lot of people are, are raised that way. And I met people at that campground um, on a different trip with a band. <laughs> Long story. <laughs> oh, God, my stories. So previously I went to the same town with a band just alone with with their well their girlfriends and me and and I would leave them and go over to the to, to the nudist beach again my, by myself and I met some people there and just made friends and we went out and partied and stuff and with the band and everybody together but um you know I met people that that had grown up that way where they went there every summer with their parents and it became it was very healthy loving families and and I thought pretty well adjusted people I don't know what I'm, I think of it now, but I just don't feel comfortable with doing that to a kid. I think it's fine if you're a consensual adult. I don't think it's fine to kind of force your kid into that situation. So we're, we're not we're not going to do that. Maybe never again. I guess who knows. But that's what we did. <laughs> One more adventure. But what else happened? since we were together is that, you know, I, I talked about hiking and mountain biking and going to parks and living the simple life, pushing a stroller around town. You know, I, I had, I had every day free. I, I had that business where I worked like maybe five or 10 hours a week and otherwise just hired people to do all the, all the grunt work. So I would actually push the stroller around town and go to parks with my son and, and just look at the trees and feel the peace. I would, when he got a little bit bigger, I would I got a bike seat and we'd bike all around town. It was just the most wonderful time, the, sim the simplicity of it, to be with this perfect, simple woman and have a perfect, innocent angel and go around town. And we also kept camping. We loved camping. As soon as the weather was good enough from May through September, we would take the tent out and I didn't want to go home. We would spend a week camping. I think for two summers in a row with a tent, we spent half the summer, like, like a full month in a tent and just being outside it was just always something that that it just made it made us feel so good and we really looked forward to it even though it was difficult with a with a baby um and that kind of takes us up to 2020 my life was pretty uneventful i would say it was a lot more of the same of what I just described. All of it. And things just getting better with Susanna. Um, even though I didn't want to get married again, I didn't believe in marriage. I thought that marriage would ruin love. I thought marriage comes with all these promises and all these rules, which were the enemy of love, which I still believe. So there was no talk of getting married. She didn't want to get married either. We already had every, everything we needed. We had love. We had unconditional love and health and enough money and everything seemed fine. Really. And that's how we rolled into the hell that we all experienced in 2020.